Today we're going to be reviewing the Volkswagen Tiguan. Now while most car reviewers would praise the Tiguan for having good road manners, despite only driving it for a week without a check engine light, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath the Tiguan to see what's inside and how it works. Now we're going to start under the hood where we have a 2 liter inline 4 cylinder turbocharged engine. This is an updated version of the EA888 engine found in some older Volkswagen products like the GTI. Now this engine is situated transversely for front wheel drive. Now underneath the battery on the driver's side we've got an 8 speed automatic transmission. Taking an overall layout of some of the components in the engine here, at the front here we've got the air intake plenum here and at the back we've got the exhaust side which has the turbocharger. Over here we've got the coolant jug, windshield washer jug which leads to the jug actually buried inside of the fender. On this side we've got an air box, the battery, the fuse box as well as the ECU. Now because this is a turbocharged engine we're going to start here with the air intake system which is a little unique. Air is going to begin its flow at the front here where we've got this air dam that's going to bring in air into the this air box which houses the filter. The air is then going to pass by the mass airflow sensor and then head down to the turbocharger. Now servicing the air filter on the Tiguan is definitely not a toolless task. You have to remove eight screws located on the perimeter of this air box. And then remove the secondary air pump hose over here and then I can lift the top of this air box off and remove that air filter. Now this air box got an interesting design. It's got a baffle on the inside here where the air filter rests and that's to allow any water to sink down and drain through this port at the bottom here inside the transmission. Now this extra hose here that connects to the air box actually leads to the secondary air pump located down underneath the driver's side headlight. Now with the air intake out of the way we've got clearer access to how things are set up here. Here we've got the air pipe that goes in from the filter that feeds the turbocharger. Now the turbocharger is going to spin up based on the exhaust gas flow and that's going to boost your inlet air pressure. You can see we've got an electronic diverter valve there to vent off any boosted pressure. Now that air which is now going to be pressurized is then going to head through this plastic charge pipe over here down the side of the engine. Now underneath the vehicle this charge pipe here is then going to take that air and bring it over to the intercooler located inside of the radiator housing over there then bring it back around to the front this side here through this charge pipe and then back up into the throttle body underneath the intake plenum. Now once the air is exchanged heat with the intercooler it's then going to head back up over here to this drive-by wire throttle body located right in the middle of this plastic intake plenum which is then going to distribute it to the individual four cylinders to get burned in the engine. Now on the side of that intake plenum we've got the air runner control system which is going to monitor a series of flaps inside of this intake plenum here to vary the flow characteristics at higher RPM to let more air in or at lower RPM to promote mixing. So now that we've seen how complex the air intake system is on the Tiguan. Well next take a look at the fuel system. Now here we've got the fuel line here which the low pressure pump from the tank itself is going to bring fuel up here. I don't really like how this fuel line is kind of just loose and jagged and so close to the front of the vehicle it's kind of dangerous. Anyways it does feed this high pressure fuel pump over here which is powered off of the exhaust camshaft. Now because this engine is direct injection only there's no port injection here it's going to have to pressurize that fuel and send it down this fuel rail here located underneath the air intake plenum directly into the cylinder. Now, of course the downside to that is is that you're not going to have port injection to help clean off the valves and you could potentially end up with carbon buildup as the mileage pack on. Now looking at the fuel tank setup on the Tiguan, we do have a plastic tank. Now it's got one section on this side, then it humps over to the other side because there's the all-wheel drive system. Now on the right side wheel well, we've got the filler neck that goes into the tank. And if you look up inside of here, we have the EVAP canister. While I'm under here, I just can't stop being reminded that everything here is made in Mexico, with the exception of this gas tank strap, which is made in Germany. Now looking on top of the Tiguan's engine here, we've got the four ignition coils and thus the spark plugs are pretty easy to access right on top. Now the valve cover is made of metal, surprisingly. However, replacing the valve cover gasket is going to be quite the job because there's a lot of wires and hoses and valves and stuff that just runs on top of this engine that you need to disconnect. Now this engine does take 0W 20 weight oil. The dipstick is located right over here. And interestingly enough, the oil filter is also located right at the top here. I wonder how much Castrol paid Volkswagen to put their name on the oil cap. Now this oil filter actually drains directly into the timing chain cover not to the valve cover. Now replacing the oil filter is pretty easy just put a big socket on here and screw this plastic cap off however it is a cartridge style filter which means you're gonna have a big mess when you have to clean that up clean up the housing and then put in a new filter and it does face upside it down which means that you're gonna be dripping it across your engine as you take it over to your drain pan. You can see down at the bottom here we've got the connectors for the oil pressure switches. Now taking a look underneath the Tiguan although the bottom is pretty flat the cover underneath here only goes up to this part here which leaves 
the entire powertrain and subframe assembly completely exposed to any elements which could accelerate corrosion especially during winter time. Now the rest of the exhaust and powertrain going to the back is also exposed with the exception of the two side covers over here. Now at least you don't have to remove this plastic piece when you're doing an oil change although the use of Torx screws is not ideal in rusty climates because these are going to get filled up pretty easily and strip out. Now with that undercover removed we have clear access to the transmission on this side here and the engine oil pan on this side. Now unfortunately the TIG1 uses a plastic oil pan with a little petcock valve here that you can unloosen with your hand to drain out the oil. You've got the level sensor over here for the computer to know how much oil you've got in there. I don't typically like oil pans that are plastic because any little graze or impact could crack them or they could even warp from the heat. Not sure why Volkswagen still has an obsession with Torx fasteners. They've got Torx all the way around the oil pan but on the transmission, they have just regular hex bolts. Now the EA888 engine does use a two-part oil pan where we've got this actual oil pan on the bottom here and then this upper oil pan here. Now looking at the rust in this block, it does remind you how old this engine is. It's actually still made of cast iron. Now above inside of the oil pan, this does have two balance shafts, one for the intake side and one for the exhaust side. Taking a look at the passenger side of the engine, we've got a plastic timing chain cover. That's right, there's a chain under here, not a belt, which is good because you're not supposed to service it over the life of the vehicle but it is a Volkswagen after all so who knows. Now this engine does have dual overhead cams with the front one being the intake and the rear one being the exhaust. They both have variable valve timing and you can see that their oil control valves are located right in the middle of these cam actuators here. Now just ahead of that timing chain setup is our drive belt setup located over here. Now at the top here we have the alternator and then further down at the bottom we have the AC compressor. Over here we have the tensioner. Now there is quite a lot of room to get my hands in here to change that drive belt from the top. Now while the alternator looks easily accessible from the top here, you can see that there's a bunch of hoses and other things in the way here. The repair manual actually recommends that you drop out the AC compressor down below and then drop the alternator down. Taking a look at the drive belt side of the engine from underneath here you can see you've got a lot of room to work here in the drive belt. Just behind this charge pipe here is where your AC compressor is located and it's pretty easy to get out just a couple of bolts. Once you remove the charge pipe and it'll drop down. Now the top of the valve cover we've got the PCV valve which has a hose that leads it to the back of the turbocharger. Now this big round thing on top of the engine is part of the EVAP system and the purge control valve located over here. Now it's hard not to notice these electronic solenoids on the front of the valve cover here. They're only on the intake side and that's actually to adjust the valves. Now there are two main engine mounts on the TIG one, one over here on the driver's side just underneath the battery and then we've got one over here on the passenger side. Now underneath the engine on the transmission side we do have a smaller engine mount that ties the subframe to the transmission. And now we'll have a listen to the startup sound. That engine sounds like it's going to die. Next up we're going to take a look at the transmission on the TIG1. It is an 8 speed automatic unit. Now you can see at the top of the transmission we have a manually selectable shifter. There's no electronic motor controlling your gear selection. The other thing you can see that's easily accessible is the starter motor. Now because this vehicle does have a start stop system you're probably going to have to change this out a little bit sooner than in a normal vehicle. Luckily though it's easily accessible once you remove that air intake. Here's a look at that starter motor from down below. Now taking a look underneath the transmission we have this plastic oil pan. I also noticed that the bell has here has these little holes here where you can see the torque converter. I'm not sure if that's good to expose that to the elements or it's better to have it ventilated. Now replacing transmission fluid on the TIG1 is quite a mission because you have a drain and a fill port located down here. Once you take this plug out you got to take out a straw and then the transmission fluid will drain out. Then once you put the straw back in you got to hook up a special machine here that will screw into here and pump fluid from the bottom up inside of this transmission pan then when it's full you plug it back up with this here. It's actually a very unintuitive design because you're pumping up against gravity. They could have easily added a fill port up top here or somewhere even up in the bell housing. Further to that check out how little bolts there are holding this transmission pan on. There's only about eight bolts or so. Most pans tend to use about 15 or 20 bolts and that's just to make sure there's no leakage in between here when this warps. So you can definitely expect this to warp and leak in the future. Now the front of the transmission underneath this block here if you follow these lines we've got transmission fluid is going to flow out to this cooler located in front of the radiator. Looking inside the grill we can see the automatic transmission cooler sitting in front of the condenser. Once the transmission is done changing its gears it's then going to bring it over to the front differential which is housed up inside of here. It'll then go out to the axle on the driver's side. Now on the passenger side here in the middle of the vehicle we've got the transfer case for the four motion all-wheel drive system. Now what this does is going to take that energy that's rotating this way and translate it to the energy longitudinally to the drive shaft. It runs the length of 
of the vehicle. Now there's no electronics here because the four motion all wheel drive system actually works in the back near the rear differential. However, servicing the transfer case is pretty easy. We've got a fill port located over here and a drain port located right here. Now that drive shaft is going to send its power out to this rear differential here. Now this differential has the differential part in the back here and the all wheel drive set up at the front. Now inside of here we've got a set of clutches that are going to lock up to allow power to go from the drive shaft to the two rear wheels according to how much power is commanded by this computer here. That computer is going to command this electric motor to lock it up hydroelectrically. Now the fluid inside of this differential is shared with the clutches and the differential itself. We've got the fill port located up here and the drain port located down here. Now Volkswagen says you have to use special all-wheel drive fluid. Now looking from underneath we've got these rear axles here that have a reasonable amount of diameter to it so you can expect at least about 50% of the power to be diverted to the rear wheels. Now take one's all-wheel drive system should definitely be better in the soccer field compared to a CRV or something. Now taking an overall look across the engine bay of the Tiguan, it does have its fair share of electronics and sensors. Now the battery is located over here and the ECU is located over here, which I don't typically like because it's subjected to any weather or impact damage in a collision. However, it is in a steel casing over here. Now the fuse box is easily accessed on the side here but it's not even labeled. Now the steering system on the Tiguan is an electric power assist. Now the electric motor is located down here on the rack. It is open to the elements, although that should aid with cooling down here when you're on the autocross in the Walmart parking lot. Now Volkswagen still uses lug bolts, which means that as soon as you zip it off, the wheel is just gonna fall right off. Ugh. Taking a look at the suspension setup on the Tiguan, we've got a McPherson strut front suspension here that ties into an aluminum knuckle. We've got a stabilizer link here that's really long and sits at an interesting angle. Now taking a look at the suspension setup from this side here, we've got a stamped steel lower control arm. We've got the inner and outer tie rods over here. And here we've got the stabilizer bar that goes over to the other side here and ties into the end link down here. Now one thing about Volkswagens is when you want to change the control arm, you got to lift up the transmission or drop the subframe down. That's because this bolt doesn't have enough clearance here with the transmission pan. It looks though on the driver's side we might have enough clearance with the oil pan though. Now looking underneath the front suspension we've got the sway bar located at the back here and we've got an aluminum knuckle. Now inside of here you can see we've got bolted on bearings and also a bolted on ball joint. So these are going to be pretty easy to replace without a press when they wear out. Now I'm actually pretty impressed that at this price point they're still including a lot of aluminum in the suspension including the steering knuckle, the sway bar link and this outer tie rod here. Some other SUVs are still using all steel design. Now Underneath the Tiguan here, you can see we've got a stamped steel subframe here that runs the length of the vehicle at the back. Now near the front here, there is no radiator support or anything holding the radiator up. It's just all held up by the sides of the vehicle. So the most structural member here is actually the subframe. Now the rear suspension on the Tiguan uses a multi-link setup, something you'd expect in this class. Although all the components back here are made of steel. Now the upper control arm is here. We've got the lower control arm back down here. And we've got a control blade located at the front here. Now the back here we have the rear lower control arm, which carries the weight of the vehicle through the spring over here. Then of course we have the strut where it joins the knuckle. The knuckle itself is made of cast aluminum. Now looking at the suspension from underneath. We do have the stabilizer link here that attaches to this lower control arm and it is made of plastic. Here's how you know the Tiguan one wasn't meant for off-roading. At max suspension droop the ABS sensor wire is pretty taut. Now replacing the shock should be pretty easy. Just two bolts that you access from outside the vehicle on the wheel well and then one bolt down at the lower control arm. Now while we always like to blast Volkswagen for making complicated designs, at least changing a headlight bulb is even easier than changing the air filter. You can just reach back here and pull off these covers for your low and high beam on both the driver's side and the passenger side really easily. Next up we're going to take a look at the exhaust system on the Tiguan. Now the back here we've got the exhaust manifold integrated into the head itself and then goes directly into the turbocharger located over here. Now the turbocharger is going to use its exhaust flow of course to boost the air pressure going into the engine. That exhaust is then going to come down over here make a 90 degree bend and go into this catalytic converter. It'll then make another 90 degree bend this way and then another one this way in order to get through to the center tunnel underneath the vehicle. Now the exhaust continues above the subframe here with a flex pipe before then going into this front muffler over here and then out the tailpipe to the back. Now that exhaust is then going to come through the tailpipe and make a bend around the differential before it goes into the center inlet muffler. Now there's a lot of free space behind this muffler before the bumper. I wonder if Volkswagen could have put a hidden compartment under here or made for a much larger, meaner sounding muffler. Now that muffler has dual outlets on either side. However, it does point downward and you do get fake exhaust tips on the bumper. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust.
Next up, we're gonna look at the cooling system on the Tiguan. Now we're gonna start here at the coolant jug where we have this cap here. This is the pressure cap for the system. Now the top of the radiator, we've got the upper radiator hose here, which is gonna lead into the block here just underneath the throttle body beside the alternator. Now this also feeds the oil cooler, which is branched off of this oil filter located underneath the intake plenum. Now the lower radiator hose has a temperature sensor on it and runs down across the bottom of the engine. Now if we follow the lower radiator hose from underneath here, you'll see it actually comes up over here and leads into the electric water pump located at the top here underneath the intake plenum. Now having the water pump electric means that the vehicle can turn it on whenever it feels like according to what the temperature sensor reading and there's no need for a thermostat itself because the electric water pump just knows when to turn on and it can also remain on after the vehicle's cut off to cool things down especially on a turbocharged engine. Now just below the vacuum pump on the driver's side of the engine down inside of here we have the water pump and a temperature sensor. Now that water pump is driven off of a tooth belt which comes off of this camshaft here. Now at the front here we have the radiator fan assembly. There's actually a larger fan on the driver's side and a smaller fan on the passenger side. Now in order to remove the radiator, you do have to remove the front fascia assembly. And here's a look at the cooling fans from underneath. You can see there really isn't that much room between these cooling fans here and the actual engine and transmission to work with because there's so much hoses and electronics that go in the way. Now another stupid thing is there's no petcock valve on the bottom of this radiator, which means that anytime you gotta do any coolant related work, you gotta come down here and remove this lower radiator hose and drain it from here. Now taking a look at the braking setup on the TIG-1, we've got a traditional master cylinder over here with a brake booster, but if you follow that booster line, it leads you to this vacuum pump, which is actually part of the housing for the direct injection pump, and those two are all driven off of the exhaust camshaft. There's not enough pressure in a turbocharged engine's intake manifold to drive a brake booster. Now from the master cylinder, the brake lines are gonna travel across to this corner here, where we've got the ABS motor. Now it's responsible for the traction, stability, and any autonomous braking safety features on this vehicle. Speaking of autonomous braking features, there actually is models of the Volkswagen Tiguan like this one, that doesn't even come with a radar sensor, which is behind its cloth. Now looking at the braking setup on the Tiguan, we've got a nice big floating caliper design here on a huge rotor. These are gonna make for really good braking power. Most vehicles this size have a much smaller brake setup. Although the only downside I find on most European cars is there's a lot of brake dust as you can see here. Now some Volkswagens did come with a wiper system for the brakes, which means that there's a little wiper here that'll wipe off any excess water in the rain to give you better wet braking performance. Now the rear brakes on the Tiguan use a single piston floating caliper design with an electronic parking brake. So here you've got that electric motor that's gonna actuate the gear set to squeeze these pads together against this disc rotor. Now, overall, the fit and finish of the Volkswagen Tiguan is okay, especially for a Mexican built vehicle. It does have its fair share of scratchy plastics and its interior design doesn't really spark any emotion. Now under the hood, the Tiguan gets a lot of points in my book for being mechanically interesting. There's a lot of new technology under here like electronically adjustable valves and the water pump setup and the turbo. It's actually pretty cool to look at and to understand. However, you wouldn't find some of this technology in more mainstream brands like a Mazda, a Hyundai, or even a Nissan. Now as an owner, however, all these complicated setups are gonna cost you in long term in terms of reliability and maintenance because it is a turbocharged engine and Volkswagen doesn't necessarily have the best reputation when it comes to keeping that check engine light off. Now you tell me in the comment section down below, what do you think of the Volkswagen Tiguan? Is this the best SUV that Mexico has to offer? Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next car review is gonna be. Subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to see more videos just like this one.